A play was written many years ago in memory of a long dead Egyptian king. Two young women were chosen to play the leading roles. The play was the whim of an American writer who thought to poke fun at ancient Egyptian superstition. Legend had it that the priests of Egypt cursed their dead king to wander aimlessly through eternity. They did this by forbidding anyone to speak his name. We call out the name Akhenaten. That night, both women had eerie dreams about the cursed king Akhenaten. One, that she was struck across the face. In the morning, she was nearly blind. Coincidence? Or was there another force involved? A curse working its evil way after nearly 4,000 years. The priests of Egypt had enormous power. Not even the pharaoh was immune from their vengeance. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Egypt. It was already a great nation 3,000 years before Christ was born. Its kings built enormous monuments during their lifetimes. By the 20th century, 33 royal tombs had been excavated in the Valley of the Kings. The most exciting discovery, however, was still to come. It would be the culmination of a sequence of events that began not in Egypt, but in the green fields of England. The Berkshire Downs. Highclere Castle is the ancestral home of the Earls of Carnarvon. The Lord who presided here in the first quarter of this century would help make history. It would cost him dearly, however. The Earl did not leave the comfort of his castle and embark on the adventurer's trail by choice. A curious chain of events compelled him to go to Egypt. The present Lord Carnarvon remembers very well how it began. First of all, my father had a serious accident in Germany, a motor accident, and he was rather badly injured. He also suffered from rather weak lungs, so his doctors said to him, doesn't matter where you go, but you must go to a dry, warm climate every year from now on in the winter months. So Papa said to himself, well, that's a fine kettle of fish. He liked shooting and everything else. So he decided that he'd go off in the shooting season by the beginning of February, and he went to Egypt. The rhythm of life along the Nile was a radical change for the Earl. After he'd been there a few months, Lord Coma was sent for him and said, my dear Porchy, he said, if you're coming out here regularly, you're going to be so bored, you won't know what to do with yourself. So may I make a suggestion? Yes, indeed, I'd be honored if you'd tell me what to do. Right, he said, why don't you take up as a hobby Egyptology? He said, it's very interesting, and what's more, he said, it happens that at this moment of time, I've got the very fella who will help you best. He happens to be an awfully nice young man called Howard Carter. Howard Carter was an intense, driven man. After 15 years with the British Civil Service in Egypt, he'd been fired for refusing to apologize to a superior. Carter stayed on in Egypt because he had a dream. By the time Lord Carnarvon returned to England, he'd agreed to bankroll that dream. Fifteen years after the bargain was struck, Carter still labored in the Valley of the Kings. His dream? To find the tomb of King Tutankhamun. Professional archaeologists thought the valley had been picked clean years before. Carter disagreed. The search was exasperating. Carnarvon was threatening to cut the money off when in November 1922, Carter unearthed a staircase. At the bottom, a door with royal seals intact. 
A door had been sealed more than 3,000 years before. Carter couldn't be sure he'd found Tutankhamun's tomb. But whatever lay behind the door was bound to make his years of toil worthwhile. And at that moment, he got uh, to the stage where he was able to see that there really was the jackpot, the hopes that they'd worked for all those years. They uncovered the steps, the first steps. And at that stage, he thought the only thing to do is to quickly cable to my father, tell him to come out, which he did. Carter waited patiently for Carnarvon's arrival. Together, they breached the door. Can you see anything, Carnarvon asked. Then, slowly, the answer. Yes, wonderful things. Wonderful indeed. Carter's vision and Carnarvon's patience had paid off. Beyond treasure, there was the undisturbed body of a long dead king. The resting place of Tutankhamun, Pharaoh of Egypt. At last, Carter was face to face with his dream. Around Tutankhamun's neck, a magnificent gold collar. Carter recognized it as the vulture goddess Nekbet, a warning to intruders. There were reports of another warning on a tablet that has since vanished. Death will slay with his wings whoever disturbs the rest of the Pharaoh. There was little time to worry about curses. Ahead lay the enormous task of cataloging the treasure. Carter and Carnarvon were apparently not the first to enter the tomb after it was sealed. There was evidence that someone had rummaged around, then fled. Perhaps ancient tomb robbers frightened by the curse. Carter gathered up the great treasure thieves had abandoned, evidence that Tutankhamun reigned in the glory days of Egypt's past. He ruled from about 1334 to 1325 BC. Tutankhamun was nine when he became Pharaoh, not yet 20 when he died. In those days, Egypt exacted tribute from Asiatic princes and carried on an active trade with the Mediterranean kingdom of Manoa. Word of the discovery of Tutankhamun's treasure spread quickly. Tourists were becoming a problem. Lord Carnarvon returned to Cairo with part of the treasure. He had no way of knowing it, but he would never see England again. Fever, brought on by an infected mosquito bite, ravaged the Earl's body. When I arrived, there was my father, pulse beating in his throat. You could see he, very bloodshot eyes, obviously frightfully feverish and ill. So I say to the nurse, whatever happens, for heaven's sake, call me. The young Carnarvon went to his own room as his father fought what was to be the last battle of his life. about five to two, the good lady is shaking me awake and she said, your father's drawn his last breath. Please come quickly. Something was wrong with the lights and young Carnarvon needed a flashlight to find his way to the Earl's bedside. Officially, the cause of Carnarvon's death would be pneumonia. The Egyptian press had another explanation. Your father. 
lava disturbed the remains of King Tutankhamen. He took his revenge, and he was responsible for the whole of the lights in Cairo going out at exactly the moment he died. Lord Carnarvon was only the first of many who would die shortly after visiting the tomb of Tutankhamun. The discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb was a great event, but the sudden and mysterious death of Lord Carnarvon had cast a pall on the celebration. Carnarvon's grieving son returned to England, only to find new evidence that his father might have unleashed some malevolent force, which cost him his life. Already, the popular press was proclaiming Lord Carnarvon's death to be the revenge of the mummy. His son took refuge behind the walls of Highclere Castle. The memory of that awful night in Cairo would not so easily be shaken. I had a little fox terrier bitch called Susie. And when I got back, very old fashioned housekeeper, Mrs. McLean, said to me, I have something to tell you, my lord, a really extraordinary happening. At five minutes to four, and as you know, Cairo time is two hours. So we're two hours in front of Cairo, she said. Susie sat up on her hind legs. Her mouth was covered in foam. She let out a howl like a wolf and fell back dead. Something of a panic set in. Collectors rushed to get rid of whatever Egyptian relics they possessed. Howard Carter's assistant, Richard Bethel, died suddenly of a circulatory collapse. Bethel's father, Lord Westbury, committed suicide. The chief Egyptologist at both Paris's Louvre and New York's Metropolitan Museum died shortly after visiting the tomb. American financier Jay Gould took ill and died within days of seeing Tutankhamun's final resting place. To date, 22 deaths have been associated with the curse. Oxford University became the center for an exhaustive study of the relics removed from Tutankhamun's tomb and for an investigation of the curse many now believed was real. Oxford's Ashmolean Museum is still one of the richest repositories of Egyptian antiquities. Historian Henry Lincoln is a frequent visitor. It's very easy with our 20th century skeptical materialistic minds to dismiss the curse of the pharaohs as absolute rubbish. Well, it is just that, absolute rubbish. Death to anyone who enters this tomb is a, a pretty fierce curse to somebody with a superstitious mind, but it's just a threat, and a pretty ineffectual one at that. And we all know that the curse of the pharaohs was concocted by the popular press because Lord Carnarvon had sold the rights to the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb to the Times, and the other papers wanted something sensational to write about. But to the Egyptians, a curse wasn't rubbish. Tutankhamun's figured largely in the thinking about the curse, and it was Tutankhamun's father-in-law who, in fact, was cursed to wander in all eternity by the priests of Amon. The ram's head god, Amun-Ra, was dominant in Egypt before the reign of Akhenaten. Akhenaten introduced the practice of sun worship, symbolized by a new god, Aten. The priests of Amun were stripped of their power. Under this new religion, only the pharaoh could commune directly with Aten. The temples of Amun were defaced but the priests bided their time. The old religion and the old ways went underground. Egypt's peasants apparently also maintained their loyalty to Amun. Akhenaten died in the 17th year of his reign. His tomb has never been found. Even as the young Tutankhamun was ascending the throne, the priests of Amun moved 
to regain their power. Akhenaten's name was eradicated from great monuments. His likenesses destroyed. There was an American artist, Joseph Lyndon Smith, working in the tombs, taking copies of the wall paintings at the time that Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered. He felt it would be a good thing to intercede with the gods on behalf of Akhenaten and to lift the curse of Amon-Ra so that the pharaoh was no longer condemned to wander forever in eternity. He was going to do this by putting on a play. A ruler is born like the Athens and will endure for eternity if only we seek his name. We call out the name Akhenaten. Akhenaten, Akhenaten. We call out the name At the final dress rehearsal, something unheard of happened. At the moment when Akhenaton's own prayer was being spoken, a colossal hailstorm began. To the Egyptian helpers who were there for the play, it was as if the gods were throwing stones at them. The rehearsal had to be abandoned. The two women who were playing Akhenaten and his mother, both that night had the same dream. Each dreamt that she was standing in a temple dedicated to Amun-Ra, and the statue of the god came to life and struck them. But for each woman there was one small difference in the dream. One of the women was struck across the stomach, and the other across the face. Within 48 hours, the one who had been struck across the body was having a serious abdominal operation, and the one who had been struck across the face had the most virulent case of trachoma ever seen in a European. She almost lost her sight. Everybody associated with that little play within that period of 48 hours had been struck down by some minor illness or other. Was that the curse of the priests of Amon, still working after all those thousands of years? And if it wasn't the curse, what was it? A new chapter to the mystery of the mummy's curse opened in 1976 at the Paris airport. The occasion was an eerie state visit. The mummy of King Ramses was arriving with pomp and circumstance due a chief of state. Something terrible was happening to the mummy, and Egypt wanted France to help. The mummy was taken to the Museum of Man in Paris. In a sealed laboratory, Egyptologists gathered. The Ramses mummy was among the most perfectly preserved of all those found in the Valley of the Kings. Now it was beginning to deteriorate rapidly. The Egyptians wanted to know if Ramesses could be saved. Tutankhamun's mummy had been ravished by the time of its discovery. Some theorized the priests of Amun deliberately thwarted the embalming procedure. There has been no public announcement to date about what the French experts found when they unwrapped the body of Ramesses. The speculation has been that a dangerous bacteria, perhaps dormant for thousands of years, is now alive and at work on the mummy. Egypt's priests knew something of biology. Perhaps they knew more than modern men imagine. In the tomb of Tutankhamun were many wonderful vessels of gold and alabaster. They were apparently designed to hold precious liquids and rare unguents. If they contained something else, something lethal, the secret died with the last priest of Amun-Ra. Nineteen seventy-seven affords millions of Americans the opportunity to see Tutankhamun's treasures. They are on special loan from the Egyptian government and will tour museums in Washington, D.C., Chicago, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Seattle, and New York. 55 works of art 
from what many consider the greatest archaeological find in history. Time has eroded much of the mystery and awe which gripped discoverers Carter and Carnarvon. The curse is probably rubbish after all. Perhaps the priests of Amun-Ra tasted enough vengeance with the deaths of Lord Carnarvon and some of his close associates. After all, Howard Carter lived out a long and happy life, and he was the first to break the seals on Tutankhamun's tomb. If the priests of Amun sought to obliterate the memory of Akhenaten and his heir Tutankhamun, they failed. Their names have been rediscovered and spoken again and again. To a pharaoh, that was assurance of immortality. Life, symbolized by the Ankh. Earrings, probably worn by Tutankhamun as a young boy. The wooden figures are likenesses of favorite slaves, servants for the pharaoh in the afterlife. Other figures guarded the young king's tomb for the 3,000 years he was forgotten. If we believe the curse, we must believe something else. We must believe that in the end, Tutankhamun triumphed over the priests of Amun.